Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And new at 6, San Marcos police making an arrest in connection with that city's first homicide of 2021. 59-year-old Melvin George Nicholas Jr. charged in the death of 33-year-old Andreas Mianpour. According to police, the victim was found in a room at the O'Connell Lodge on Guadalupe Street this past Tuesday night. We're told the cause of death is pending an autopsy. Nicholas arrested today. He's being held at the Hayes County Jail, charged with murder. Throughout this pandemic, we've learned of the heightened danger COVID-19 poses to long-term care facilities. Right now, one out of every three residents at the Frank Tejeda Texas State Veterans Home in Floresville has COVID-19. Now the city's mayor worried about the still unanswered question of how it happened. Garrett Berger brings us the latest. The numbers were disheartening for Floresville Mayor Sissy Gonzalez Dipple. When I first heard it, I just felt sick to my stomach. As of Wednesday, 40 of 120 residents at the Frank Tejeda Texas State Veterans Home in Floresville were sick with COVID-19, along with 14 of the 120 staff. It's at least a second outbreak at the facility in less than a year. I'm going back to other uh, other facilities near us that have had have had cases, but much smaller cases. I have to wonder in my mind how this came about. A spokesman from the General Land Office, which oversees the state veteran homes, declined to comment on what may have happened, saying it would be speculation. The Health and Human Services Commission confirmed in a statement that it has been investigating the facility. The Health and Human Services Commission confirmed in a statement it's been investigating the facility something triggered by even a single positive COVID-19 case in a licensed nursing facility. The outbreak's occurring amid vaccination efforts at the veteran's home. 81% of residents and 64% of staff already got a first dose during a clinic on the 5th. And the GLO says further vaccine clinics scheduled for the 26th and February 16th are still expected to proceed. The hope provided by a vaccine reassures the mayor some, but she's still concerned for those who are sick. My prayer is that it's contained to those 40 and no more. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The San Antonio Food Bank hosting another mega food distribution today, but this time making sure that families' pets were also being taken care of. Today, they were out at Gustafson Stadium handing out food. Masked volunteers loaded up trunks with canned goods, fresh produce, and more. Recipients also got some pet food. Food Bank staff says it's one of the many items they get a lot of requests for have things like cleaning supplies and pet food um, and those things are really critical because many families who are um, you know accessing SNAP don't have that opportunity to uh, purchase it with that with those dollars and so um, it's really an opportunity to be able to support them. PetSmart charities donated the pet food given away today. These mega distribution events are hosted by the San Antonio Food Bank every Friday. A tractor trailer driver dead killed in a fiery crash. According to police, the big rig was carrying molasses into San Antonio when it drifted off of I-37 near Loop 1604 on the southwest side last night. The semi hit a guardrail and a bridge abutment, then flew off the overpass and landed in the eastbound lanes of 1604. The trailer separated from the truck, spilling molasses all over the highway. The cab went through a guardrail and burst into flames on that embankment. The driver of the big rig has not been identified. We have learned the name of the man police say was killed in a crash while racing his motorcycle Monday night on the city's south side. The Bear County Medical Examiner says 30-year-old Wasim Mukrani died from injuries following the wreck in the 9,000 block of Southeast Loop 410. That's near I-37. Investigators say that Mokrani and 24-year-old Jeremiah Matthew Lerma were racing when they collided and lost control of their bikes. We're told Mokrani slid into a light pole and died there at the scene. Lerma suffered non-life-threatening injuries. He's been charged with racing, causing death. New at 6, an encouraging update. Last fall, we told you about Alfred Guetta, the 94-year-old veteran who earned both the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart in World War II fighting in the Pacific. After a family member posted on Facebook that his home had fallen into disrepair, it seemed that help was on the way, but then things got hung up due to the pandemic. That is until now. Jesse Degollado shows us what's been done over the last several days. The crew putting a new roof on this west side home actually was doing more than that. It's a mission of mercy, 
says the daughter of a soon-to-be 95-year-old decorated World War II veteran, Alfred Guerra. It's heartwarming and it's very overwhelming to see so much help. Help, she says, that she didn't realize was out there. Fred Alvarado with Broken Warriors Angels. It's veterans helping veterans. Purple Heart recipients like Tony Roman. The least we can do is uh, make sure that he has a comfortable home to live in. Companies like the roofers who didn't stop until it was done. Our business statement is is to give back, so it's, it's just a great opportunity. Over the weekend, more than a dozen veterans of three wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Vietnam, gutted the interior ahead of the electrical and plumbing work still to come. Alfred Guerra's daughter says her father was so eager to come back to his home, he even tried moving out of her house before the work was done. He says, I'm going to go home. Now, you can't go home. There's no walls. And he goes, I'll pitch a tent if I have to. I don't care. And I'm like, no, 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 we can't let you do that. I said, can't do that. Not at least for another month or so. Roman says they just need a company to hopefully donate central heating and air. It may still be a work in progress, and Alfred Guerra's memory may not be what it once was. Well, I'll never forget what you did for me. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Time saver traffic right now. Let's go to Loop 410 and Fredericksburg. You can see it uh, looks like a traffic pull over there by the police. A few cars involved. Don't know if it's an accident or if they pulled somebody over for a traffic violation. Again, it's 410 at Fredericksburg. Traffic, though, moving smoothly. Today, many are mourning the loss of baseball and civil rights leader Hank Aaron. Aaron died this morning at the age of 86 after a legendary career with the Milwaukee and Atlanta Braves, despite enduring racial threats. Aaron once said, quote, if I was white, all America would be proud of me, but I am black, end quote. That was almost a year before breaking Babe Ruth's home run record in 1974 with his 715th homer against the Los Angeles Dodgers. It earned him the title of baseball's home run king, which he held for more than three decades. Devin Clark spoke to a former Major League Baseball player from San Antonio who met Hank Aaron as a kid and then knew he, too, could break down barriers. But Hank was an inspiration because we all was able to touch him. And you could see him. Odie Davis III is personally feeling the loss of the baseball legend and civil rights icon, Hank Aaron. I think that being readily available for the community was his biggest trait. Davis III traces the influence Aaron had on him back some six decades, during the time his father, Odie Davis Jr., created an east side neighborhood baseball team known as the Denver Heights Bears. It had little resources and outright prejudice was rampant. But Davis III says Aaron gave the motivation. He had come to the YMCA to talk to all of us. And uh, and as I said, I guess it's a special moment. You look back at it and being 10 or 12, that means that's 55 years ago. Davis III would go on to have a career in Major League Baseball. And in 76, I got drafted by the Cubs. And in 1977, I ended up signing with the Texas Rangers. And then Davis III played for the Cleveland Indians in large part. He credits his career to Aaron, born in 1934 in the segregated South, a man who he knows had it even harder than him. And they were able to be successful during that era, and it, it, it made anything that you try to dream believable. And around the same time that Aaron was making his mark in the major leagues, Davis III and so many other young, talented baseball players were honing their skills and cultivating sportsmanship here at Pittman Sullivan Park. And today, this park still serves as a recreational space for youth of all ages and backgrounds who may one day find themselves carving a path in the big leagues. For now, reporting on the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. It was nice to see some sun out there, especially before we get to the weekend. Adam. Yes, because you know what the weekend's going to bring. You've been paying attention, Myra, and that I is, <laughs> of course, <laughs> some low clouds and some damp conditions. We'll talk about the actual rainfall potential in a moment. The aquifer didn't really change much today. It's down a tenth of a foot. We're four feet below the January average. Now, this is something that's very noticeable today. Mold is high again at 4,100, and mountain cedars back up into the high category with a count of just over 1,600. Today, we topped out at 
nearly 80 degrees. The high was 79 in San Antonio. Notice the record 84. So we were only five degrees shy of the record high temperature. The average high being 63. Right now we're at 74 degrees, dew point of 52, so not not too humid out there, of course, with the lack of humidity, but warmer temperatures. You look across the state and there's a big difference between the 70s to near 80 we have here in South Texas to the 40s and right about 50 degrees off to the north. Abilene 46, Dallas at 50, Lubbock right now at 43. There is a boundary across the state and we're on the warmer side of it and that will be drifting south later on tonight and our temperatures will be a little bit cooler tomorrow as a result, but also thick cloud cover across the northern tier of Texas really helped to keep their temperatures down. So quite a contrast for our friends and family off to the north compared to what we had around here. This evening, temperatures falling to the 60s gradually, 67 at 8 p.m. by 10 p.m. 61, and by midnight will be in the mid 50s. So a comfortable and pleasant evening, gentle breeze out there. The low clouds fill in around and after midnight, and that's going to lead to some dampness late on Saturday. Saturday is going to be one of those days where it looks like it could rain at any moment, but we're really not expecting any shower activity. Just a few sprinkles here and there by the afternoon and then into the evening. Sunday is going to be damp as well. We're going to talk more about that coming up in a few minutes. We are still dealing with a tremendous surge in our community when it comes to COVID-19 right now. We're still seeing very high numbers each day during this daily briefing. Let's see what the numbers hold today. We're joined by Dr. Jason Miller, who is the chief of staff of Southwest General Hospital here in San Antonio. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we are adding another significant number of cases uh, of COVID-19. There are 2,247 new cases of COVID-19 in our community, which brings our total to 157,835. That makes our new seven-day rolling average 1,971, so it has dipped below 2,000. Unfortunately, we are reporting again 17 more deaths tonight, and they range in age from their 40s to their 90s. Uh, and, you know, I, I think all of us now uh, know someone or a family member uh, very close to us who we lost to this terrible virus. And so please keep uh, their families and their friends and survivors in your prayers this evening uh, and throughout the week uh, as we remember those uh, who have lost in our own community as well as throughout the country. In our hospitals tonight, we're seeing a, a third night of decreases in area hospitals, thankfully. There are 1,393 patients uh, in our local hospitals fighting COVID-19. That's down 26 from yesterday. Uh, as far as new admissions, we saw an increase yesterday, excuse me, an increase over the last 24 hours, 181 new admissions within the last 24 hours. Uh, at this point, we have 414 on intensive care and 252 on ventilators. Th both of those numbers are slight decreases from yesterday. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Well, you know, I would have thought things would slow down a little bit. You know, we're, what, 22 days now past the holiday season, but it's still spreading at a very, very fast pace. And then uh, the fact we've uh, gone up by 40 with new patients in the hospital. I know the hospitals are doing a much better job, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, but let, let me kind of quickly go over with you what's happening at Wonderland. I know uh, some of you may uh, uh, would like to get your vaccinations out there. Uh, here's what we've been doing this week. We've done about 41,000 this week, uh, and we're uh, doing school districts and, and, and UHS um, uh, patients uh, in our Bear County Hospital District. Uh, but next week, we're going to start Monday finishing up what we'll be doing with the school district employees. And then starting Tuesday, uh, we'll begin uh, vaccinating the general public again. Now, the following week, the following week, February 1st, starting February 1st, we'll have doses of Moderna and Pfizer at the, at the site for the, your second dose. Upstairs, we'll have Pfizer. Downstairs, we'll have Moderna. And we're going to be able to do 3,000 a day uh, when you start uh, coming coming on February the 1st for your second dose. Then starting on February the 8th and February the 15th, we're going to go back to our regular schedule of doing first doses. And you can go to our site, 
which is WeCanDoItSA.com, starting tonight at 6 o'clock. And go ahead and sign up for any of those weeks. We've been restricting it to one week at a time. But we're going to go ahead and have people sign up, not knowing for sure that we'll have the vaccine. But we figure it would be a lot easier to have everybody sign up so there won't be such a big crush in that one week. And so um, you go to that site starting at 6 o'clock and begin to sign up uh, uh, to get your vaccination. Great. Thank you, Judge. Before we uh, close out, uh, let me turn it over now to Dr. Miller to give us some uh, insight in what's happening. at the local hospital. All right, those are the latest numbers from City Hall tonight. 2,247 new cases, again, eclipsing the 2,000 mark. Uh, but the seven-day average drops below 2,000 to 1,971. That's a seven-day average, which, they, which authorities say more accurately reflects how many cases in the last 24 hours. 17 new deaths, though, people ranging from the eight in their 40s to their 90s and another drop at the hospital, which is good. Three nights in a row. Now we have seen a drop in the hospitals. Uh, currently 1,393 people hospitalized with COVID-19. You heard the judge there talking about the vaccinations that University Health System uh, is going to be administering over the next couple of weeks. He said starting on February 1st, Wonderland of the Americas, they're, they're going to have doses of both Moderna and Pfizer available. And around that time, he believes, is when they'll be able to administer 3,000 vaccinations a day. He said you can go ahead and sign up for those that opened. That sign up opened 18 minutes ago at 6 o'clock this evening. You can go online to WeCanDoItSA.com. Again, WeCanDoItSA.com to sign up for an appointment. Though he did say that they're letting people sign up, not knowing if they will actually have enough vaccinations, but they're hoping to beat a rush of people who would uh, wait to sign up until we know for sure those vaccines will be available. So hopefully all that comes to fruition. Interesting uh, thing that the county judge said that I took note of. He thought things would have slowed down by now, and he says, quote, still spreading at a very pa fast pace, end quote, when he's talking about our community and the spread of COVID-19. All right, let's switch over to weather right now. What a beautiful day today was. Yeah, balmy, I mean, relatively speaking, in the low 80s in parts a of South Texas. A balmy January day. <laughs> I mean, considering the, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, the average high is 63 and we made it to 79 today and we were missed a record by five degrees in San Antonio. But let's take a look at our overall weather pattern. We had a few little showers pop up south of San Antonio earlier this morning. They were a welcome sight. You'll see them move through here on the satellite and radar composite. Most of the activity off to the north of us. And we're looking at our next system that's coming our way. It's in Northern California right now. That's going to drop southward and pass just north of our area. So most of the energy and precipitation with this as we get into Sunday is going to be in North Texas and especially Oklahoma as that system comes together. For us around here, we're looking at a gray weekend with a little bit of dampness. So let's talk about it. Our future cash shows those low clouds filling in tonight. First thing tomorrow morning, gray. It may look like it's going to rain, but we're not expecting any precipitation until we get a few sprinkles developing by Saturday afternoon through Saturday night. Sunday morning is probably going to be the peak of our dampness. Drizzle, sprinkles, fog, wet roads. Maybe a few hundredths of an inch, but that's pretty much it. And that dampness is going to last for a good portion of the day. Rainfall accumulations, maybe a trace south of town, up to a tenth of an inch. So despite two cloudy days and another stretch of damp weather for over 24 hours, there's not going to be a whole lot to show for it here. 63 on your Saturday, up to 74 on Sunday with that dampness, and you'll notice humidity back in the air. It's going to be a sticky Sunday, and then Monday the humidity's gone, back to sunshine, temperatures in the low 70s, and actually next week, a lot of sunshine and looking fairly comfortable, mostly in the low to mid 70s. Yeah, look at those temperatures. Thanks, Adam. All right, so yesterday I know, Larry, you profiled the Lytle girls basketball team correct and uh, there's another team's playing pretty good basketball in our area yeah we're going to start with uh, jefferson high school of course where greg simmons went to high school he's very proud of the mighty mustangs because they are having a historic basketball season these young ladies know how to play ball and the antonian lady apaches well they are state ranked and on a roll as well coming up
home tonight to face the Dallas Mavericks to tip off a nice stretch of home games the silver and black nine of their next 11 games will be at the AT&T Center including two straight tonight with the Mavs and Sunday with the Wizards so far San Antonio is two and four at home while the Mavs are five and five on the road this season the Spurs did not hold shoot around this morning so here's the matchup tonight at 730 Dallas is favored by two highlights on the night beat and that's a big night for the Antonian girls basketball team because the Lady Apaches will open district play with Incarnate Word. Antonian is 14 and 3 and ranked number two in the state in 6A private schools by the Texas Association of Basketball Coaches. And tonight they want to keep it going against the Shamrocks. It's very important to us because Incarnate Word has always been our rivalry, so we want to go out there and do our do our thing and beat them. I didn't know how big of a game it was until I got here. Um, and they're all Incarnate Word this, Incarnate Word that. So we're gonna, we got to beat them tonight. It's a big game. Antonian will play at Incarnate Word tonight at 630. Now over at Jefferson High School, the girls basketball team is having a fantastic season. The best in program history, which dates back to their first season in 1975-76. They are 17 and 3 overall, 12 and 0 in District 27-5A with four games to go. Tuesday night, Jefferson beat Highlands 52-31 to grab their first playoff berth in school history, but they still have some work to do. It's the first time in school history. It's a lot to take in because it hasn't happened before. It feels good, honestly. Winning is such a great feeling, and that's what Jefferson is doing in a big way this season. Second year head coach Natasha Benavides has her team believing. For these girls, it's making history. Um, it's doing something that's never been done. You know, coming in, they didn't really believe that they could ever get to this point. So actually seeing it and putting all the work forth, uh, it's paying off and it means everything to them. And it means even more to the seniors on the team. Honestly, since my freshman year, I never really thought it would happen. It's always been a goal for mine to ever like senior year. It's the year. I think that it's nice that we were the first to make it. It's very exciting. There's a lot to do, a lot to prepare for it. The Mustangs are riding high and feeling all the positive vibes from the Jefferson community. Uh, you know, all the alum, everyone is, is probably more excited than us right now. You know, we're walking through the hallway and people are just showing so much love and support. <laughs> With a playoff berth locked up, the first place Mustangs are now focused on winning the District 27-5A championship. Coach is making sure the Mustangs stay on course. We keep our girls focused uh, by making sure they understand it's a day at a time, a game at a time, anything can happen. We already beat our goal to go to playoffs now. We're trying to uh, go to win district. Uh, at any point we can shut down. At any point, any team can beat us. Our district is, is so competitive. This is such a big thing, but there's still four more games, and we have to focus on those because there's more goals we want to get to. And championship season is already underway. District 26-6A swimming championships at Bill Walker Pool this afternoon. Girls 100-yard butterfly in Johnson's Samantha Robles holds off a late charge from Churchill's Carly Cronk to win in 55.89 seconds and set a new pool record. We've got more highlights from around the area at our website at ksat.com. And I love the look on her face right there. What? I just set yeah, the pool record? How exactly. awesome is that? By the way, you mentioned Greg Simmons win to Thomas Jones. Jefferson. Yes, sir. It's not. I know it's not Simmons Gym, but is it Greg Simmons Gatorade Cooler at least? Maybe something like that. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. There's a plaque and everything. Yes. More, <laughs> more accurately reflecting his athletic, you know, past. Greg, I didn't say that. I'll be right back. <laughs> Their mission is to save lives that the coronavirus would take. Orcio Garcia is the executive director of the Children's and the Adult Emergency Department at University Hospital. She has a staff of nurses that she works with. Thank you for joining us tonight, first of all. And second of all, what is it like to be in the middle of this surge right now for a lot of your staff? Good evening. Thank you for having me. Well, right now they are working hard. They're working long hours um, and they're anxious and they're tired. I can't imagine what nurses and doctors have been going through over these last 10 months. And when I think about what's happening in the hospitals, I think too about the patients who are alone. They're there by themselves. They don't have family to help them out, uh, to be there for them emotionally as well. So not only I have to imagine it's physically exhausting the work that your nurses are doing, but are nurses having to kind of share that emotional load with patients and, and fill another role for them in that way too? 
They are, but I will tell you, um, our, our profession um, stems from caring, um, and, and that doesn't ever go by the wayside. So these nurses absolutely share in that with the patients and their families, and they make sure that we are communicating and keeping them informed and providing the comfort they need to, to fight the disease. But this is something that, I mean, other than the first surge, I mean, this is something that is outside normal for the nurses there to be the only ones in the room, no other family members in the room with many of these people. You're right, it's very different. Um, you know, it's definitely brought technology to the forefront and that helps us, it, you know, phones help us, FaceTime helps us, all, all of the technology that we have to try to bring them just a little closer together is so helpful. And I think that the patients and the nurses appreciate it very much. You've talked about things that, that are helping. Uh, we've heard from other medical professionals about lessons learned from the last surge that are becoming helpful this go round. So can you maybe give us some insight to some of the things that are perhaps a little bit better at this stage, things that you're maybe doing differently or um, you know, things you decided to change to make this work a little bit better? Absolutely, we, um, we definitely learned lessons and, and we got a little better at it. Um, we changed the way we stock our supplies. We changed the way we move patients. We changed the way um, what's available, how we coach um, through putting your PPE on, taking your PPE off. We changed a lot of our processes to accommodate and make sure that our staff and our families and our patients were safe. How do you make sure, I mean, I guess there's no way to make sure, but how do you help your nurses deal with the stress that they're under, both the physical and the mental stress uh, that, this, that this pandemic has, has brought to uh, so many in the health profession? Well, thank you for that question because we remind them that we have to have a healthy outlet and healthy coping and that self-care is important. One of the things that, um, thank you to our chaplain services, um, they helped us uh, make a space that we had available into a recharge room. Um, and it's almost a meditation room of sorts with essential therapy, um, some adult coloring books, and just a quiet, cool, dark space to go when you just need a second. And that's something new that we developed um, since the pandemic um, hit. And it really seems um, to meet that need when someone just needs five minutes to decompress. Can you walk us through, I don't know if there is such a thing, but an average day, uh, your nurses dealing with COVID patients, how many patients would they maybe be dealing with? How many hours are they working in a shift? What does a day look like for a nurse right now? Well, right now, uh, a nurse working um, with a COVID patient will have usually two to three patients, depending on how sick they are. We wanna make sure that the patients and the nurses are safe. So usually two to three patients. Um, and they stay in their PPE most of the day. Um, so, you know, their, their, their faces get itchy and um, a little rough, but um, they usually have people outside the room um, to, so that they don't have to come in and out of the room so that they hand them things that they need. Um, they have people to help them don and off, which is putting on and taking off PPE. And they spend most of their time in the rooms with their patients just to lessen the exposure of coming in and out. Uh, most of the time will be spent, I, I would say, you know, 10 of the 12, 13 hours that they're there are gonna be in the room with their patients. What can the average San Antonian do to help? Thank you for that question. We need everyone's help. We need everyone to wear their masks, to socially distance, and to just to do good hand hygiene and wash your hands. That is our frontline defense, and we need everyone to help us with that right now. We need to slow the spread, and we can only do it together with your help. I, I, and I want to make sure that you feel, I mean, I'm certainly thankful for the health community, healthcare community, for your nurses, for yourself, for all that you do there. Do you think that your nurses are feeling that gratitude from the community? Absolutely. Good. We get um, such wonderful notes and comments, and the community comes forth and they, you know, bring them snacks and they have the community has been nothing but great to the staff. And I know that they feel that gratitude. And there are ways, like you said, in which we can all help and we're all 
in this together, as we have heard so many times over the last several months. So again, thank you so much for what you do, and please pass that on from us to your staff as well. I will do that. Thank you for having me. Have a good evening. You too. We'll be right back. A new episode of KSAT Explains now available to stream. And this week has nothing to do with the pandemic. Instead, pro sports and the possibility of another pro team coming to San Antonio, the subject of this week's KSAT Explains. A subject that has been brought up many times over yeah. the years in San Antonio. A source of frustration. Uh, absolutely. So we take a look at what are the possibilities of that actually happening. A second pro team coming to our area. And we found out, of course, it has so much more to do with whether there are just fans to fill the seats. It has everything to do with our economy. What kind of jobs are here, the income levels of San Antonians, education levels. So we really explain why it's a much bigger picture than just is there enough team spirit, if you will, to support a second team. And, but there, and that's the thing. I think there are a lot of people in San Antonio and South Texas who feel like we've already proven we can support a second team. When you look at when the Saints were here, when you look at some of the leagues that came and left, the the football league that was just here for six games and the you know they had the biggest right. attendance in the entire league was San Antonio and then gone I yeah. mean you you when you talk about football you talk about baseball you talk about major league soccer we have dabbled in all of those arenas yeah. and tried to get a team here but it just hasn't happened so even if you're unfamiliar with that past we explain all of those attempts why this has always been something uh, no matter what the administration looks like at City Hall it's been on the minds of city leaders for years uh, we take a look at whether this is something where we are right now is it something that actually could happen or what needs to happen to get a second team and does san antonio need a second team that's another question that a lot of people ask is that something that we need in san antonio do we need to change in order to get one so a lot to look at in this episode i think yes okay that's i think yes we need one that's what i think i think we're a, i think we're a major league city I, and Kasky says yes, so we've got two yeses. Okay. I'm not weighing in either way. I'm just telling you all the topics you need to consider when you look at this episode. Check it out, ksat.com slash explains. You can also watch all our episodes there as well and on the KSAT TV app. Speaking of Adam Kasky, let's go live to the studio with Adam. Thermometer Thursday Field, right? Has a good ring to it, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, looking outside right now, beautiful out there, gorgeous sunset, nice evening. Right now we're still in the low 70s and it's feeling looking nice and not too humid either. We had the warmth today, but not the humidity. 74 right now we will drop down to about 60 degrees at 10 p.m. So comfortable all evening long. Tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to temperatures in the lower 50s. It's going to look completely different this weekend, feel a little different and we'll have some dampness. We'll talk about how much actual rain we could see coming right up. Not much can slow down or delay super spy James Bond, but it looks like the pandemic is more than a match for 007. The latest film starring Daniel Craig has been delayed again. It was sent to open on April 2nd. But MGM announced it's pushing the film back to October 8th. The 25th Bond film has already been delayed three times since the coronavirus pandemic started. It was the ma first major movie to be delayed because of the outbreak, but far from the last. Mm -hmm. All right, outside today, it was a beautiful day today. Picture perfect. Oh, just not. It wasn't on a weekend. <laughs> I was really hoping it would like spill over yeah. a little mm. bit. Yeah, not so lucky there. Uh, uh And it's going to be another a stretch of weather here where we have a lot of dampness, but not a lot to show for it. So first, let's look at how warm it was today. Uh, we were five degrees from a record high temperature in San Antonio. We topped out at 79. Elsewhere, we did make it into the lower 80s. Catula 83, Laredo topped out at 82, Hondo 82, and New Braunfels even made it to 82 for the high temperature. Right now, we have a little bit of mid-level cloud cover, but for the most part, a clear sky for the moment. The clouds will be filling in later on tonight, but it's comfortable. 74 degrees with a dew point of 52, so 
some warmth, you know, relative to this time of year, but still a lack of mugginess in the air. South southeasterly breeze at seven. That's going to be shifting around as we get a northerly wind later tonight. Right now we're mostly in the 70s, but the exception is the hill country in the 60s. Kerrville 66, Rock Springs at 63, still 79 degrees at this hour in Catula. Then you go farther to the north. Our friends in Abilene, Dallas, Lubbock, 40s to near 50. Even Lubbock only at 43 degrees. There is a boundary west to east right across central Texas and we have that cooler air to the north but another significant factor was the the really thick cloud cover throughout the day off to the north of us you look at the visible satellite imagery with our sunshine we boost it well into the 70s and even low 80s and of course uh, right along 20 here from Abilene to Dallas only 40s to near 50 with that low cloud cover throughout the day and we did have a few pop-up showers south of San Antonio earlier today that was a very welcomed sight and then other parts of Texas of course had some rainfall as well, and I do foresee a fairly active weather pattern in the basically the days and I want to say maybe a couple of weeks ahead, but it looks like a lot of that activity. The energy is going to be just just north of San Antonio. First such disturbance right now is in Northern California. This is going to drop southward and move into Texas, but North Texas, so I don't think it's going to have a big impact on our actual rainfall accumulations. Most of the act activity with this in terms of showers will likely be North Texas and especially in Oklahoma. We'll still have some dampness around here and it's going to be gray, but not a whole lot to show for it. And I think our future cast illustrates this well. The low clouds, they take over again tonight. We wake up to a gray morning. It's going to look like it could rain at any moment, but I really don't think it's going to until we get a few sprinkles by tomorrow after at uh, tomorrow afternoon and even a little bit of drizzle activity as well, probably around and after 4 p.m. That's going to thicken up a bit Saturday night into early Sunday. So Sunday morning, I think, is going to be that persistent drizzle and dampness and wet roadways, reduced visibility, but no actual embedded real showers within it though it could add up to a few hundredths of an inch here and there. And I think that dampness is going to last for a good portion of the day on Sunday. So Sunday, pretty much an indoor day. As for accumulations and the rainfall potential, again, a few hundredths of an inch maybe in and around Bear County. The farther north you go, you could see a tenth of an inch, but that's it for our actual high end potential this weekend, despite clouds and some dampness. So tomorrow morning, cloudy at 52 by the afternoon, a few sprinkles. 63 degrees, the high temperature, not as warm as today. Sunday's going to be back into the 70s, and you'll also notice sticky humidity back in the air on Sunday with that dampness. And then we get into Monday, we're going to get rid of the humidity. It's gone back to sunshine and very comfortable start to the work week. I know we're going into the weekend. You don't want to be thinking about Monday yet, but I'm here to inform you Monday's going to be a pleasant day, sunny 73 and lower humidity. So call in sick. Oh, wait, no, no, that's what, not what he meant. No, Sorry. Not, shh, no, in case you missed it coming up next. Here's today's I see why am I. It is Friday, January 22nd. The Fiesta Oyster Bake 2021 at St. Mary's University canceled for a second straight year due to the coronavirus. The St. Mary's University Alumni Association making that announcement just a few hours ago. The association cited substantial COVID-19 cases in the area as the reason for the cancellation. As of now, Fiesta is still set to take place from April 15th through the 22nd. But again, Oyster Bake will not be happening in 2021. San Antonio police say another man died overnight in a crash. Police say that happened around 1230 this morning at Loop 1604 and I-10 East. An officer says a man driving a pickup truck drove through a dirt field next to a gas station. They say the man was ejected from his truck and he died on the scene. Police are still working to determine what led up to the driver going through that dirt field. A Bear County Sheriff's deputy has now died. He was likely the death was likely the result of COVID-19. 23 year veteran Deputy Jessity Zamarone died Friday while battling coronavirus. It is likely that Zamarone was infected around New Year's Eve. He was 68 years old. Well, here's a sweet job. The Candy Fun House in Mississauga, Ontario.
is looking for candiologists. I may have messed up that name, but that's okay. Cool. Uh, it's a fancy title for someone willing to get paid for eating thousands of confectionery products. The position pays $30 an hour and is available for full-timers or on a permanent contract basis. Those interested in applying could do so through February 15th. How nice. There are many good reasons for lottery players to be buzzing about tonight's Mega Millions drawing. A billion reasons as of this afternoon. Tonight's jackpot is now worth $1 billion. A lot of people thought there was a pretty good chance it would reach those lofty heights after no one won the previous drawing. Yeah, ticket sales have helped drive the jackpot higher and higher, and more people will be probably lining up to get their tickets for tonight's drawing. Of course, we'll have the numbers on the night beat, but the odds of becoming a billionaire are slim. One in more than 302 million, you're more likely to be struck by lightning, be allergic to water, or make it in the NBA under six feet tall than win tonight's Mega Millions. Say it. But I am saying <laughs> exactly. there's a chance. So you're saying there's a chance. That's what, exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. What do you do or take if you're allergic to water? Is there such a thing? I, I, would I say it if there wasn't such I, a thing? I, I don't know, Spreester. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have a little bit of it falling from the clouds this weekend. Not enough to put a dent in our drought, but just kind of nuisance, drizzle, and sprinkles late Saturday, then off and on through Sunday. And best of luck to everybody with their Mega Million tickets. Caskey's over there Googling what to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you on the night beat again. We'll have those numbers at 10.